Hello, hello. How are you guys? It is Tuesday. Um, what day is it today? It's February 8th, 2022, and we have sound. <laughs> How are you all? I hope that this finds you all very well. Uh, welcome to this place. Welcome to new viewers who are just checking out the show for the first time, and welcome to those who are coming back and are continuing to watch the show. Thank you so much for being here. If you could take a moment to hit the like and subscribe button, I would really, really appreciate it. And of course, to our Patreon community, you guys are the ones that keep the lights on here, literally and figuratively, um, throughout the days, weeks, and months. And I just really appreciate that you are here. I wanna welcome you, thank you for being here. This is, if you can believe it, this is episode 233. And uh, for the first time in a while, actually, my wheels are quite empty. I don't have a ton of spinning going on. It's probably because of all of the weaving that's been going on. There's just not time for everything. I, I don't know how that's the case. I mean, who knew? <laughs> you can't do all the things. Um, but on this sort of, um, you know, overcast day where it's trying to rain and it's cool outside, I was freezing after lunch, just absolutely freezing. I ran upstairs, put on a warm sweater. Um, I was thinking about sort of the lack of projects and I had this aha moment that um, it's okay for one, but also when projects start to finish off and you're starting to get to the end of certain things, there is this time where your bobbins are empty, your needles are empty, and you're kind of just waiting for the next thing to start and the next thing to happen. So I definitely have been feeling that lately. I am still working away on my Tofino road trip. That's this spin here. Um, this is a BFL silk blend that I bought um, at the beginning of COVID, <laughs> back in March of 2020, and uh, it's called it's called Tofino Road Trip. Uh, that's the colorway. It's from uh, Sweet Georgia. Um, I loved these colors. I saw the two braids, and I just love them. And I've talked about this quite a bit. This spin. I've talked about it also on uh, the wool circle. I am spinning a three ply fractal and because I had 200 grams of fiber, uh, it's ended up being a big spin um, because you know it ends up being just shy of about 75 grams per bobbin. So it's a lot of spinning. I started the second to last bump of fiber uh, this morning actually during virtual spin group and uh, I'm just kind of getting getting going with them and, and getting toward the end. So um, once I get through that one, I'll be able to spin through this one and I'll be able to start plying, which is pretty awesome. So we'll save the plying for the wool circle. Um, you guys will, I'm sure, have some questions about plying a three ply and what I'm looking for and all that kind of stuff. We haven't done that for a long time. So I wanted to make space to be able to do that. So welcome to everybody that's in the chat. It's good to see everybody. We've got a lot of the same uh, like a lot of our, our um, regulars, but I'm sure there's going to be a couple of new people that are able to come because of the new new time for the live stream. I don't know if it's going to stay at 1 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday afternoons. It might go to 11 or 12. I'm just kind of trying to see what's going to work. So I, I hope that you guys are willing to sort of see this through with me and just figure out what's going to work. There are... Um, there's just a lot that I'm juggling and with trying to fit everything in on two days, I know many of you are super sympathetic um, because the kids are only in school for two days. It's just trying to figure out what's a good mix of um, being able to do everything but also giving myself a little bit of quiet before kind of the craziness of the rest of the week starts. Um, I really appreciated the feedback on the survey. It was a tie pretty much between Tuesdays at noon and Tuesdays at 1 p.m. The only difference was that 1 p.m. catches a little bit of our friends down under. So it's kind of a compromise between Europe and Australia that we that we go sort of in between because I know it's a little bit late in the UK, but I also know people are up and probably happy to sit and watch as they're winding down for bedtime. So it's a catch-22, right? Not everybody goes to bed at 8.30 at night like I do. <laughs> so it's good to see everybody. Uh, welcome, Kim, it's good to see you here. I'm, I, I saw what you had done with the wool circle. I, I'm, I'm glad that you're excited about it. Um, we've been covering a lot of ground on the wool circle recently and I hope that you guys find that useful. Sharon is working on a three ply Icelandic. That sounds fantastic. 
And uh, what else is everybody working on? Kelly just sent off 22 pounds of wool to her, her uh, local mill. She does, uh, we'll talk about Kelly actually right here. Um, I've got some of her North County Cheviot yarn, which I've been re-knitting because I ripped back my Lunenburg. So we'll talk about that. What else are you guys doing? Um, yes, you can't oversleep Kelly anymore. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, but it's 2 p.m. in, in Alberta. Um, hopefully you're not sleeping at 2 o'clock in the afternoon unless you're working night shifts. Um, it looks like Bridget's sewing a hand-spun, hand-woven jacket. That sounds amazing, Bridget. I can't wait to see photos. Um, what else are people doing? Uh, 12 or 1 is fine too. Thank you, Sharon. That's very helpful. The wool circle streams move a little bit now. Great question, Rebecca. So she's just wondering when the wool stream circles, wool circle streams are. Uh, they move a little bit now. So sometimes they're at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning and sometimes they're still at 6.30 Pacific in the morning on Tuesdays. Sometimes it's Mondays. This week it was Monday. It was yesterday morning. Um, they, 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 they're moving around a little bit to accommodate my schedule. So they're usually um, at 10 a.m. On, on Monday morning. I know for some of you with young children where your kids are maybe in school or preschool or whatever, I know the daytime hours actually kind of help you guys because I had a couple of comments from people and they were like, this is actually really good that the podcast is going to a weekday daytime because my kids are at school too. So I know that there's We've all got different schedules and, and I know it's hard. Um, Dagmar says it's 10 p.m. now, but it's totally okay for me. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're a night owl. <laughs> I'm not. Um, oh, Vicky's spinning white Welsh. Ooh, I bet you're covered in uh, uh, just um, um, Kemp and, and, and flyaways and whatnot. Um, if you guys are part of the School of Sweet Georgia, Vicky is hosting a uh, make and wake, make and wake and make. I can never say it properly. Anyways, it's 5 a.m. Pacific till 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific on uh, Wednesday morning. So if you guys are around, uh, that's 5 a.m. Pacific uh, with Vicki. And you've got to be part of the School of Sweet Georgia for that. All right. Oh, good, Erica. She's staying up especially for me. Oh, I feel so special. Okay, so every Tuesday, Erica, you're going to be going to bed, um, going to bed, uh, late. <laughs> so on the show today, my wheels are basically empty. I'll talk about that a little bit. I did finish some spins over the course of the last few days. And I wanted to share with you some knitting that I've been doing and some fit issues that was my big cast on over the weekend that I'm probably going to have to rip out. So let's get into the show and I will share those things with you. And then we've got lots of community participation for this week, which is always wonderful to be able to share. So I'll see you guys on the other side. Had to laugh. The credits from the wool circle from yesterday morning started to play, and I had to uh, I had to stop <laughs> and start the other one. It's kind of been one of those weeks. Anyhow, it is uh, pouring down rain now, so the rain has definitely started now, and I can hear it on the um, on the window panes and stuff. So um, I was kind of distracted, and then I looked over and I was like, "Oh no, wrong credits." <laughs> So why don't we talk first actually about some of my finished spins that I've done over the last couple of weeks. So we kind of ended up in it inadvertently having about 10 days off of the podcast and not um, having a stream on Saturday. So that kind of pushed, gave me those couple of extra days. And um, one of the first things that I actually finished was, where is it? 
This has been hanging out behind me on my distaff of my Kromsky Minstrel for, I don't know, the last few months, like since October, maybe September. And the, um, yes, Martha, you are, <laughs> you're in the live show. Um, and yes, Sam, the, the wool circle was yesterday morning. Um, I had, there was a typo in the post that said Tuesday, but it's actually, it was Monday. Anyways, it'll be all sorted out for next week. Um, so the show is available now, the wool circle from yesterday morning. So I had had this strict hanging out on my distaff of my Kromsky minstrel for many, many weeks. And I finally just said to myself, I have to just spin this. I need an ounce of fiber for each skein that I want to submit for my Hand Weavers Guild of America Master Spinner just Certificate of Excellence. And so I've been slowly figuring out what I want to do, what fibers I want to pull from my stash, what I want to use, and just creating um, basically a bin that's all labeled that has everything in it that's organized and ready to go. And the sort of the, the gist of it and sort of what ended up happening was um, this this ounce of Australian flax that I had that was lime flax um, that I had been able to get for a workshop that I was teaching back in the fall just was hanging out on my minstrel and I thought, oh, I bet you it's about an ounce of fiber. What I had originally was just over an ounce. So I don't know where some of the fiber went. It was probably just sampling and spinning it in other places. Anyhow, when I measured it, it was less than an ounce. It was 0.78 of an ounce or something like that. And I thought, you know what? This is actually a, probably a blessing in disguise because I can just spin through it, practice a few different things, practice spinning it off the distaff, practice spinning it from my hand and not having it loaded on anything. If I wanna pull out a tea towel, I can spin it from the tea towel. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I can just play with it and spin through it. And so I did. I sat there and I spun through it. It took about two sessions, about two hours worth of spinning. And I spun through it all. It was, um, it was okay. I often use my um, fingers and use my saliva to um, wet, wet spin the flax. I, I find it's just an easy way of doing that. Um, with this, it was okay. Um, I found there was, it spun very fine, which is what I wanted. Um, the finished yarn is about 60, is about 32 to 34 wraps per inch. It's singles, I left it as singles, I did not ply it. It's a lovely yarn. It, uh, I, I did scour it for an hour on the stove with some detergent and baking soda to get it really, really clean. And uh, I didn't boil the water, I just kept it at a low simmer for the full hour. It came out very dirty. But the finished skein is really, really lovely and it's strong enough that I could totally weave with it if I wanted to and, and play around with it on the loom, which is really fun. But um, I, it, it wasn't my most favorite to spin and even though it was supposed to be lime flax and it was supposed to be all organized and all really nice from the one end, um, or like like hackled and combed and all in the same direction and so on and so forth. It wasn't really, really, really smooth to spin. Um, I did find that it was a little bit, um, a little bit difficult and not, not super, super, super fun. Um, so I'm hoping that with some, I've ordered some more lime flax and that is next up um, once it gets here is to sp measure out my ounce of fiber and to spin that up and to put that skein away. So that is what I am doing. Um, Sarah says, I'm, I'm really, I really need to learn how to use my distaff. You know, it's one of those things you've got to pull it out and you've got to just start playing with it and you've got to just start using it. And um, it's, it's just one of, one of those things and loading your flax different ways is definitely the way to go. Um, try different, di try different techniques, try different approaches. Sharon's wondering what spinning from the tea towel is. That was the photo there. I added it while I was talking. Um, you fold up your strict in the tea towel and we'll be talking about that some more. Oh, I'm shaking the table. Sorry, you guys. Um, we'll be talking about that some more in the teaching content that will come out in April. So March will be our introduction to flax and we'll talk a little bit about the history, a little bit about um, um, the planting and the harvesting. And then in 
Uh, April, we'll be talking a little bit more about how to prepare your flax for spinning, and then we'll talk about some different methods to spin your flax. So that is coming up. Um, Rebecca just realized that one of her hand spun socks went through the washer and dryer. Wah, wah. I'm so sorry. I hope that they're not totally terrible um, and that they haven't um, completely felted. It sounds like they have. No good. So thank you, Amanda. She says um, it looks lovely. Thank you so much. So that was the first thing I finished. And then the second thing I finished, which is actually hanging on my branch behind me right there, that cream colored skein there, I finished up my Chaotic Fibrous Merino Flax Silk Blend. So this, I don't know exactly what the ratios were of the fibers. I think somebody, if my memory serves, I think somebody had email, had messaged me no, that was about, that was about um, my white-faced woodland that had llama and Raimi and stuff in it. They had messaged me and said, I think this is what the percentages are because this is what mine was, which was really helpful. So thank you so much. Um, but with the chaotic fibers and the hedgehog fibers, these merino flax silk blends, they're kind of hard to say. Um, it doesn't say what the percentages are on either of them. So the merino... The hedgehog fibers one is right there, and that's that dark bluey looking one. It's actually very gray. And then the one next to it is the same blend, but it's the chaotic fibers. So we talked about this on the podcast on the wool circle quite a bit. And what ended up happening was we were talking through sort of how to spin these blends and why they're intimidating for a newer spinner and why I had stashed mine and why I had left it. And really what we came out with was the fact that the, the flax that's in there, it's, it's basically toe flax and it's not particularly blended. It's sort of um, just laying next to the other fibers. And if it would be helpful, I can throw in a photo of what the hedgehog fibers look like and hopefully that would be helpful for you guys. So this is before pre-drafting, before um, doing anything to it. I, I hadn't stripped it down yet. It was just the comb top out of the bag and the photo will rotate and come up in just a minute. You'll know it's the hedgehog fibers because it's brightly colored, whereas this one's undyed. And so in the wool circle, we got talking about like what we would do with this. And so everybody said about the hedgehog fibers, we'll throw it on your drum carter. But the problem was that the colors in that comb top were split complements and complements. So you had orange and blue and orange and purple. So if you had thrown that through the drum carter and carded that all and made this really super smooth bat, what you would have ended up with is a chromatic gray. So this was what the hedgehog fibers looked like when before I had done anything to it. And so we talked about that for a while and the other color that was in there, but it was very, very subtle, was a little bit of yellow. So you've got every single primary color that you could possibly have in that braid. You've got red, because it takes red and blue to make to make the purple. You've got blue, you've got yellow, and you've got orange, which also takes red to make. So you have all the colors of the color wheel. And I don't particularly like chain plying these yarns because with the uh, flax in there, flax doesn't really bend. It curls and you can create loops, but you can't really bend it. It's really good for boucle. Um, so the problem is, is that, you know, what do you, what do you do? So we talked a lot about pre-drafting and we went through all of that on the wool circle. And then this chaotic fibrous uh, comb top, it wasn't, um, blended, it wasn't dyed, it was just the comb top. And you can see that it was a little bit better blended. It was a little bit, a little bit better. So what we did was an experiment and we went through and I broke it all up and I broke it into two halves so that I would have two bobbins of singles to be able to ply into a two ply. And um, I carded it all and it just made the most, the loveliest yarn. So it's higher grist than the Hedgehog Fibers because of course there was more air in it, it was easier to spin, it spun up a bit finer, and um, I'm just in the process of like measuring all of it for the two yarns and to do kind of a comparison. And you guys have seen them before because I create them almost every month, um, but I'll make a chart of the two yarns and compare the measurements of them, and that'll be in the Spinning Pearls content for the teaching content for uh, March when it's released to all of the patrons. So um, watch for that. But that was really fun to, to ply and to actually see it like 
finished. <laughs> it was so good. So love that. Love this skein. Yeah. Um, wonder if all those fibers would take the dye. Yes, so they do. Uh, great uh, comment, Rebecca. She said, wonder if all those fibers would take the dye differently. They do. And actually, if you guys want to wait a split second, I will throw up a photo of the finished skein of hedgehog fibers and you will see how different it is um, in terms of what those colors like how they spun up so this was the comb top and you can see how bright the colors were they were really vibrant um, that orange was really coming through it was really really nice and then that was the yarn so muddy gray um, it's a chromatic gray basically so it's a medium value um, it's it's you know you go from this and the thing is is like i expected that um but the all of that dye that was sitting on the flax it all washed out in the wash water so i had to rinse and wash it like seven times to get all that dye out um we were wondering actually in the wool circle if maybe some of the dye hadn't taken properly if maybe it wasn't bound to the fiber properly because there was so much dye coming off um regardless you've got um the silk is going to take the dye in a certain way but i have no idea what the percentage of silk was and then of course the flax it's all going to rinse off and and none of that dye because it's acid dye it's not going to take and then of course you've got the acid dye taking to the merino but merino doesn't take the dye quite as brilliantly if it was superwash merino it would have um Will you go through how to keep the flax fiber? I've tried to spin it before and it's so fly away. How to keep the flax fiber together. Yeah, so that's all part of like, you can put it in a tea towel, you can um, wrap it around your wrist. Um, there's, there's different things. Yeah. I wonder to Charlotte if it's prickly. She's wondering if it will be prickly. I wonder. So I'm planning on weaving with this. Um, I'm planning on... Um, uh, possibly making like a denting scarf with this and just to see how it weaves and to see what it does uh, the denting scarves are where you actually leave gaps in your in your reed when you slay your reed so you can do that on the rigid heddle as well which is kind of brilliant um, you leave gaps and then what I, what I would do is weave uh, squares so I would sort of create like a grid and I just finished a denting scarf um, and I showed it to you guys either last week or the week before. I can't remember which. And um, But you can check it out on Season 3, Episode 1 of Jane Stafford's Online Guild. So that is that. All right, let's talk about some knitting. I should probably go to the big camera. And I'm just going to fix the top here. So... I have a couple of, um, I have a new cast on. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but I, I wanted to just show you guys, I made some progress. <laughs> so I ripped back, um, I took out the body, I took out all of the underarm extra stitches that I had that were under the arm here. And um, I took those all out. I tried it on my dress form again after I had taken it all out. I was about two inches down on the body just to be sure that I wasn't doing all of this knitting for naught. It's still a bit baggy. It's still a bit big, but you know, I think it's going to be okay. Um, that's kind of the overall fit of the pattern. And once I do the sleeves, that'll kind of pull it in as well. Um, and take out some of this bulk that's under the arm. That's just sort of loose stitches right now. It's amazing how much that actually helps and, um, create structure in your garments. So I've made some progress. I think I've knit, I don't know. I've got about four inches done, five inches. Oh, five inches. That's great. I've knit about five inches. I've got about another. So I want, I would like, I would like to make this about 13 inches long before I start the ribbing. If I have enough yarn. So I've got to do that two more times, basically, basically. So, uh, yeah, so that's that. It's lumpy and bumpy because of re-knitting, but that'll all block out. This is Lunenburg by um, Amy Christopher's, Amy Christopher's. I always get a comment in the, in the, uh, in the comments on, on YouTube that somebody's laughing at me for, for not knowing which way her name is said, because in Canada, you can say it either way. So it's, you don't, I don't know. Anyhow, um, this is a, it's sort of a combination of like mosaic color work as well as color work. And it's, uh, it's out of Kelly's North County, um, uh, Chevy it that she gets mill spun at one of her local mills. And I'm just really enjoying it. The Brown is actually a, wool suffolk from my own stash and then the white is the undyed so it'll be really fun to see this finished 
I would like to get it done. It would be great to have it done. I, I'm, I'm starting to get excited about it again. So I need to just, um, pers you know, persevere and, and get it done. So that is Lunenburg. And then I cast on, this is from Dizdaro Ranch. These skeins are absolutely massive. Um, this is what they call Copaca. <laughs> so C-O-P-A-C-A, -A, Copaca. And this is DizdaroRanch.com. And um, I think that it will, um, it, it's just a really fun yarn. It's a fingering weight. It's almost, uh, it's a fine fingering. It's not a heavy fingering at all. And the other sweater that I really wanted to make this year was the Woolen Honey. So this is an Andrea Maori pattern. I've had it in my queue and I've owned the pattern for quite a long time, embarrassingly long. Um, and like a lot of things, it just kept being put on the back burner and on the back burner. So this is called Copaca because it's a 70-30 Coriadale Alpaca blend, which is really cool. So if you look at it up close, it's got a wee bit of a halo. And that's probably, you know, that's probably from the alpaca. There's still some VM in it, which I just love. True farm to yarn. And um, I got the color, this is in color, I think they call this the camel. This is a bit closer to the color back here versus here. This is a little, it's showing up a little bit brighter than it actually is. Um, and there's 710 yards per skein. And actually, I can't remember off the top of my head what, how many yards how many ounces per skein? I think it's like seven ounces. It's something crazy. Um, let me just look it up really quickly. Um, it's 700 ounces per... Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I have it written down somewhere. It's like five ounces or something. It's a huge amount, a huge amount. So 710 yards. Um, yeah, so that's what I cast on. However, I'm having some fit issues. So I had talked, I think it was last week about the swatch and that I needed to go down in needle size. I had a chat with Brittany, who's actually here, um, Crux Fibers. I was talking to her about what I should do. I needed to downsize. I figured probably to like a 3.25 or a three millimeter needle from the three and a half called for in the pattern. And I'll just change cameras for you guys. And Brittany actually made a comment about the dyes. So I need to uh, have a quick look at that. So this is the beginning of the wool and honey sweater. And um, if you can see, it looks like smocking, but it's not. It's done with wrapped stitches that you drop down and it makes these honeycombs. The back neck um, is worked with short rows before you go on and start your honeycomb. So you've sort of got this garter rib before you start the honeycombs. And like with my hair, you won't see the back of the sweater, so it doesn't matter but you maybe can see that this is a wee bit tight. <laughs> there is no give. I did the tubular cast on that she calls for and I did not downsize needles. I did this in three millimeter needles. And then of course in the pattern, you go up to three and a half and I just stuck with the threes, but this is a wee bit tight. So I'm pretty, I've sort of come to the conclusion that I need to I need to rip it back and, and rip it out and start all over again. So this is going, as I was knitting it, I was like, this looks like it would be a good size for Nora. <laughs> this is not good. She's eight and I'm not. So um, I am 30 years older than her. I think that it might be good if I stopped knitting and I just kept knitting. So sure enough, this is just, it, it probably actually isn't that tight. Um, like once you get it on, like once it's washed and blocked, but like it's pretty tight. Like I think once it's on, my concern is that it would like pop up, that it would kind of act like a turtleneck and it would kind of like bunch up around the neck. Do you know what I mean? And it wouldn't like lay flat and lay properly. So fit, fit, oh fit. Sometimes I just want to shake my head and say, why do I bother knitting sweaters? Seriously, sometimes. It's not the sweater, it's not the pattern. It's just frustrating sometimes. You know, you get, you get, you start something and you're like, I did my gauge swatch. I figured out what I need to do and what I need to cast on and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then it all kind of implodes and you think, why do I do this to myself? It was kind of one of those weeks. Can anybody, um, 
sympathize. <laughs> I just want sympathy. <laughs> um, so Brittany says, Yeah, this is actually a really good point now that I have a chance to stop and read. Uh, dyers don't usually use both dye types for both fiber types. My guess is that the acid dyes are metallic, which can still bleed. pH levels in the water can also cause bleeding. Very different. Uh, so many different variables. Absolutely. Good point. Um, let's see. Do you think the linen and flax would, the, the flax would soften with use? Probably. Like once it's woven into a piece of fabric, I think it would definitely... Um, it would definitely soften. And, um, in terms of the dye, uh, Rebecca had said, I wonder if they used the protein fiber dye and not cellulase. Absolutely. There's way more Merino in that, um, in the, in these blends back here, the, uh, the Merino flax silk, there's way more Merino in them. So they absolutely were dyed with, with acid dyes, not with fiber reactive dyes for sure, for sure. Um, and that's pretty standard. That's, that's not unusual. So that's for sure. Um, no, definitely. I, it won't change with blocking. I won't be able to get that neck out. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be that way blocking or no blocking. So yeah, Nora turns eight next month. <laughs> Technically she's still seven, but goodness gracious, she's a month away. Um, that would drive me crazy having something that tight on my neck. And the other thing, Kelly, is that I think it would be tight, but the other thing is it would ride up. So it would be constantly coming up and you'd be constantly pulling the sweater down. And the other thing is it'd be really hard to wear anything underneath because it would be constantly coming up. So it's just a fit issue. That is okay. Um, Alicia says, when I started mine, I cast on after the collar. Um, and plan to go back and add the color less last. Okay, so that is what I did for my, uh, what's it called? What was that sweater called? It's the one with the tulips. It's not actually tulips, they're like something else, but I call it the tulip sweater. Uh, my pink velvet, not even close. <laughs> Not a tulip in sight, but to me, they look like tulips. The pink velvet, that is exactly what I did, Alicia. I uh, cast on and I started knitting and then I went back later and I did the collar. I did it on this sweater as well. And somebody is going to ask me what this sweater is and what it's called and I will forget. So it is the Seva Boulen. It is by Jessica Gore. I love this sweater. I just wish I had knitted a bit longer. Um, but there is the Ravelry link to my projects page in the live chat, and then you can link to the pattern from there. Um, oh, and then I should link for you guys Wool and Honey as well. So Wool and Honey is um, here. This is my projects page, and then you can link to the pattern from there. And Pink Velvet is here as well. And it is probably, Pink Velvet is probably one of my most favorite sweaters that I've ever made. Um, before besides Jingle and the Spark Cardigan, a couple of other ones, the Acer. Um, it's definitely up there on, on my list of some of my favorites. So I know Eve says that Nora was two when, when we met each other. I know. And now she's, she's turning eight. She's in grade, she's in grade two going into grade seven. It feels like, um, because we have had to, I've had to talk to her teacher about her work and, um, it's just not, not challenging enough. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. Luckily we've got options. I'm very thankful for that. So yeah, so that's what I was thinking about doing. So Alicia, that's wonderful that you had said that. I definitely will. I'm, what I'm thinking I'll go back and do is cast on a regular cast on, start knitting. And then, um, so basically what you do is instead of having the, uh, ribbing for the collar worked into the sweater what you do is you cast on the same number of stitches but you start knitting right away and then when you go back to do the collar you can do it a little bit looser you can pick up more stitches if you want um, so that it lays really super nice and flat and you're happy with how it how it looks and you can make some adjustments at that point and then i could do a tubular cast off so i would still get that really stretchy nice neckline but um, with a tubular cast off instead of a tubular cast on so that's okay um, what is it? Lemons and lemonade, something about that. My wool and honey has a tight neck, but it doesn't ride up. It does sit high though. Okay. That's really good to know, Brittany. Thank you for sharing that. Good to see you, Crystal. Thank you for coming. Um, they had two, I know the tubular cast ons and cast off. They look so good. I know. I, I totally agree, Brittany. Okay. 
so that was kind of it that I wanted to share with you today um, about what I'm working on. I had one more thing though that I wanted to share and it's weaving related. So for those who are not weavers, I am totally fine with you um, sort of tuning out for a few minutes before we go into community participation. I totally understand. I totally get it. So I have been saying for a while and I think I put the book away because I just had too much on my desk today. Um, I had said for a while that out of the next steps in weaving, which is a book by Patty Graver, if you're a new weaver and you're just kind of getting started and you've done some tutu twill, you've done some tabby, i.e. plain, plain weave, um, and you're just sort of looking for those next projects and you're really wanting to learn, I would highly recommend that you get that book. It's called Next Steps in Weaving. My friend Kelsey had recommended it to me and I got it right away and I, I haven't made as many of the projects out of it as I had hoped that I would by now, but I've been a bit sidetracked with other things. Anyhow, one of the things that I really wanted to do and my weaving mentor and I had sort of put together a bunch of projects that we thought would be really good for me as like next steps and this was one of them. So this is my very, very first foray into overshot. So what overshot is, is basically plain weave. So that's the white, this is me warping. I finally put my warping board up on the wall. If you haven't done this, you need to do it. It was a game changer for me. Um, so what overshot is, is basically you've got plain weave in the background. So for what I did was uh, it's 10 to cotton and woven at 20 ends per inch. So slayed at, at uh, two per dent uh, on a 10 dent read. And you're weaving a plain weave background. So if you can just kind of get through your mind that the background of this and that the fabric behind is plain weave, then you can start to understand overshot and how it works. Um, and then you're taking a second yarn, and I mean, you could use as many yarns as you want, but here I'm using a second yarn. And this is a 3-2 cotton, and you're putting it over top, and you're creating these floats, which then creates pattern. Isn't that cool? So all three of these little samples that I started off with, none of them are balanced. None of them are a 50-50 plain weave, um, where you've got the same ends per inch as your picks per inch. And I was just learning and I made several treadling errors and all sorts of things. And they're just the first three and I'm actually really excited to pull them off the loom and just look at them just to like see what I've done. Um, but these should look more like circles. They should be a bit rounder and you can see halfway down in the photo, there's a treadling error. Totally fine. Doesn't matter. I'm just learning. So yeah, so overshot, super fun. <laughs> <laughs> Overshot is fun. Um, it's fun. Good job on the weaving board. I know ergonomically I should have hung it up years ago, but it was one of those things where I needed that particular section of our bedroom. It's behind our door and there's our little, our, we call it our little hobbit door that goes into the attic that's right there. And um, we just needed to like clear things out, clear things away, um, start getting ready for our full house reno that we're doing um, this spring. So um, brand new floors, paint, baseboards, get rid of these black baseboards. If you haven't noticed them, I don't know how you couldn't, but they drive me crazy. I hate them. Um, so all this stuff we're doing. And so we've just been clearing out the house systematically. And I was finally, I said to Mike, I'm like, we have to get my warping board off the ground and I need to get it on the wall. So that's one thing that we could do and just get it taken care of. He's like, perfect, done. So we did. Yeah. Yeah, just mug rugs. They'll probably just go into my samples, to be honest. Yeah. Haven't tried overshot yet. You know what, Dana? I hadn't either. I don't know why I waited so long. Um, it's just absolutely, Sarah, you said it. It's it's stunning. It's a stunning pattern. So um, I recommend chalk paint inside the warping board. Then you can mark notes and things. Oh, what a good chalk paint. What a great idea. And then you can mark, make notes. Um, and things on the wall and then erase it. What a great idea. So on the inside of the warping board, if you painted that, that sort of rectangle with chalk paint, you could totally um, write it up. That's fantastic. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's go into community participation and, uh, and then we'll, it'll be time to say goodbye. I can't believe it. It's, these shows just go like that for me. I don't know about you guys, but the live stream just flies. And I look at the time and I'm like, how is it that time already? I just can't keep up, can't keep up. So I'll see you guys on the other side.
So we actually had a couple of questions this week that were really, really good um, that I wanted to answer because I thought that they were just really um, good questions just in general. And I realized that I don't think I put the photo that Amber had posted. Um, I don't think I put it in the... Um, I didn't put it in the live stream software. So I'll go to the main camera and I'll, I'll answer that. I'll answer it here. So you're not looking at a, a big black screen. The other thing is, uh, Erica asked, um, Erica Weevolution. She had asked, Oh, um, I'm surprising. She said, interesting that you're using cotton for your supplementary weft instead of wool. It's funny you would say that because I actually have a hand spun skein that I was going to pull out and I was going to give it a try. I just hadn't had a chance yet. Cause yeah, that's my goal is to play with, um, my hand spun yarns. So yes, very, very great. Um, Eve is wondering how easy chalk paint is to cover after you've used it. We used to have a big chalkboard um, in our kitchen. It was like the entire wall and we covered it. Uh, it took one coat of one coat of prime um, and then two coats of like regular paint to totally cover up the uh, chalkboard, like the chalk paint. And then if you're um, wanting to put the chalkboard paint on the wall, so that was to get rid of it. We just didn't want a big black wall anymore. And then to paint it and to actually make it, it was really easy. It only took about two coats and it probably actually only needed one coat. It's, it's, it covers really easily. So it's not too heavy. And some of the new, like the new paints, they're, they're pretty awesome. Like the technology is pretty, pretty awesome. So we had a couple of questions and ask anything like I had mentioned. So Amber says a question about estimating hand spun grist. I don't, when, whenever somebody says estimating hand spun grist, I, I have to admit, I do kind of cringe. And the reason is because it's really hard to estimate your grist in your hand spun, because you might think that you have, um, a whole bunch of yardage and that you've got this really great grist and then you go to actually measure it and you don't or vice versa. You don't think that you have very good grist. Like I didn't think that I had very good grist with my merino flax silk yarns, but because merino is so light, flax is so light, silk is quite light. Um, my grist is around 2000 yards per pound. So, um, it, it's really, really hard to estimate your hand spun grist. So what she says is I've been spinning for about six months now and I have a yardage counter and a nitty knotty. So I've checked my yardage two ways. According to the wraps per inch or the control card, I have to check my yarn size. I check as I'm spinning to say consistent and my three ply is fingering weight or about 14 wraps per inch. So to me, 14 wraps per inch is kind of more like a sport weight. So it sounds like you're spinning sort of a slightly heavier fingering weight, um, or, you know, into sport weight. Um, however, the 116 grams of fiber, this three ply I'm doing for socks came out to be only 165 yards. So her grist, we're just going to do some quick math here. Her grist is a hundred. So it, her, her yardage is 165 yards, but she had 116 grams of fiber. So doing the quick formula to figure out her grist, her grist is only about 645 yards per pound. Um, it's about 646 yards per pound. I'm putting this in the, in the chat so that I don't forget. So she says, does that sound normal? If I were buying a commercial yarn, that would be more like a worsted or even a bulky yarn. My brain is apparently missing something. No, it's not. It's okay. <laughs> and I'm spinning this for socks. So I did short backwards with fairly high twists and then I plied with high twists. So about 45 to 50% twist angle. So it is very dense. I just wasn't expecting that to be the yardage. They could be the heaviest socks ever. Okay. So there's a couple of things here. Don't compare your hand spun yardage to, and grist, sorry, to commercial grist. Um, commercial grist is done. The, I think it's the yarn council of America. They put out a grist calculator, like a, like a chart. And it's got all of the grist. You know, if, if you've got this grist, then it's yarn. That's this thickness. If you've got this grist, then it's this yarn. This is your hand spun and you're making it at your wheel, um, with your hands, your fiber. Um, you don't know what the, uh, what, what, what fibers are in those yarns that are, um, 
being used for in the um, grist sort of standardization, if you will, and you're not a machine. So you're not spinning the yarn the way that it would be spun in a big mill. Um, there's a huge amount of air that is left in most 100% wool yarns. So if you're uh, looking at a wool yarn that's a commercial yarn, that has a grist of whatever. Um, so let's look at like Cascade 220. There's 220 um, yards per 100 grams. It is a grist of about a thousand yards per pound. It's like 999. So a thousand yards per pound for a worsted weight yarn. But if you deconstruct Cascade 220, the singles are only twisted enough that they're barely held together that they can then get it plied. And then the plying is just enough to get it off the bobbins and into a skein and off and out of the mill. Because the longer a skein of yarn is spending on those machines in the mill, the less money they can earn per skein, right? Because the faster they can skein it and get a skein made and get it out of the mill, they can sell that yarn and go on to make more yarn. So I know Alden Amos makes a comment somewhere in his hand spinning compendium about the fact that commercial yarns are only twisted enough to get them out of the mill. That doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them. It just means that you're dealing with a very low twist. And what happens with that low twist is you also have more air because you're not cinching down your singles and cinching down that in the plying and taking out all of that air. So what I think is happening is that you're a newer spinner, you're still learning, you did short backwards, but how much did you pre-draft and pre-attenuate your fiber? How tightly did you press down and squeeze as you were uh, moving back? Were your fingers skimming along the surface of the singles or were they kind of squishing it down and, and you know to within an inch of its life where you've got a lot of fibers, individual fibers being compacted down into that singles, making it a very dense yarn and leaving very little air behind. The more air that's in your yarns, regardless of how thick it is, the higher your grist is gonna be. The less air that there is and the uh, more fibers that there are, the, the lower your grist is gonna be. So you're gonna be closer to 100 than 1,000 if you have a lot of fibers and no air. If you have fewer fibers and more air, you're gonna be closer to 1,000, just for an example. It's not necessarily 1,000, it's just, um, just an example to give you a visual. So um, with socks, I used to say like high twist, high twist, high twist. You need tons and tons of twist. I, based on all of those socks that we made back in 2016, 17, and 18, um, you know, the ones that I have worn the most and that have worn really super well and haven't come apart are some of the ones that were kind of just right in the middle, but were made out of hardier fibers. So they weren't made out of superwash merino nylon. Um, they weren't made out of any synthetic fibers. It was the the wools that were right smack in the middle, Wensleydale, Suffolk, Dorset. Um, what were some of the other ones we made? Uh, BFL. Um, and I and and didn't have so much twist in them that they were spun to within an inch of their life. Because remember, the more twist you have in your singles, and then the more twist you have in your ply, the more stress and strain you're putting on those individual fibers at the molecular level. So that something that's really, really tightly twisted, you can see it with your own fingers. If you twist your fingers and make it really, really tight, all of a sudden you're, you're, it hurts, like you're you're cutting off circulation, you're bending the bones, you're, you know, and bones don't bend. But if you're gently twisting them and you're locking them together and giving yourself enough twist that you've got a really good, stable, sturdy yarn, um, they're gonna they're gonna wear really well because those fibers, the the strands, the yarn strands sitting next to each other are going to rub. And if you've got a 100% wool, not a superwash, but an actual wool, those scales are gonna open up in the washing and they're gonna lock together. And you're gonna create a really structurally sound fabric. And you don't need to do all of that stuff, all this stuff in the spinning to create a structurally sound fabric. So I would encourage you to sample and I would encourage you to play. Um, and I would encourage you to try in the future um, pre-attenuating and pre-drafting your fiber um, to within an inch of its life, like really pre-draft. 
and then and and strip it down if you're trying to spin thin strip your fiber down make it make it thinner than the width of your pointer finger like make it smaller than your pinky and then pre-draft and try to leave some of that air in there does that help i hope that's helpful people are saying it's helpful <laughs> Uh, Mandy says this ex explanation is helpful. I had the same questions about grist. It took me a while. It's funny you would say that, um, Mandy, that you'd experience that as well. Because when I first started spinning, I was like, okay, we need to look at the commercial grist and then we need to be going for it. And I pretty quickly threw that out the window and realized that grist is very individual. I can spin the exact same fibers as my neighbor and we can spin the exact same commercial comb top, for example. Give us the same comb top. Tell us to spin it exactly the same way. So we're sitting there, we're sitting next to each other, we're spinning exactly the same way, and we will come out with two completely different grists. And it all has to do with how dense are you spinning. If you want a airier, lighter yarn, you have to get more air into your yarns and you can't squeeze it all out. And there's two ways that you can do that. You can pre-attenuate, um, you can, not smooth your fibers so run your fingers down the edge of your fibers without actually squeezing um i guess there's three and don't put so much twist in that you're that you're clamping everything down that as you add that twist it becomes it becomes more and more and more dense and you're losing that air so it's kind of three three things hand spun socks are my absolute favorite and most worn knits hands down yeah kelly it's funny because i know for many of us um those are some of our favorite things to to do and to make um, all right. The other question that we had was from Laura. I'd like to buy a fleece, a fleece source book, but I can't decide which one. Rachel mentioned a few books in the last spinning pearls video, the spinners book of fleece. That one's by Beth Smith, the fleece and fiber source book by Carol, um, Acarius and Deb Robeson and the field guide, the, the field guide to fleece, which is also by Robeson and Acarius. Does anyone have any recommendations? Now people answered Laura and they told her what they thought. Um, it really depends on how much detail you want to go into. So the Spinner's Book of Fleece by Beth Smith is excellent. And um, it covers sort of the big ones, the, the, the fleeces and the fibers that you're going to come across the most often. So Romney, Wensleydale, BFL, Corydale. Um, she really champions the fleeces that I think often get overlooked, like Corydale, Wensleydale, Romney. <laughs> um, but, but it only covers what it covers. However, she has a whole section in there on combing and carding. And she goes into quite a bit of detail about those things. And you also get some of her sort of own knowledge about what she thinks about um, fleece and wool and just the sort of her general passion about it, to be honest. Uh, but it's not going to give you an over sort of a blitz of everything that's out there. The Fleece and Fiber Source book, that's exactly what it's going to do for you. It's going to give you detail on pretty much everything that's available in the English speaking market. Um, there are sheep breeds and fleeces and whatnot that are not included. It's because they are not part of the English culture around the world. And they're very clear about that at the beginning. Um, and they encourage those who are sort of in non-English speaking cultures who are multilingual or bilingual um, to sort of pick up that that cross and to try to try to help to educate others about some of the sh fleece and sheep and spinnable fibers that are out there that are in the non-English speaking world because they had to cut it off somewhere. They, at some point they had to say enough is enough and get this thing to print um, so that we could have it in our hot little hands. So if you want a textbook, an encyclopedia, um, a book for on your coffee table that your friends and family will pick up and look at and say, oh, isn't this cool? These cute little sheep. That's the book for you. It's also costs more. It's a bigger book. It's heavier. It's harder to travel with. If you want something that you can take with you to fiber shows and flip through because you can't remember what the difference is between CVM and, I don't know, Rommeldale, I, newsflash, they're the same, um, then you can, and you, and it tucks in your pocket and it's only $15, then you want the field guide. It really depends on how much detail you want to go into and what it is that you're spinning. The other thing I would recommend is these are great gifts. Our friends and family want to give us stuff that we actually like and want to use. Books we're excited about. My, my in-laws have no idea what I do. They have no idea what knitting and weaving and spinning is. They see me working on stuff when we're, when we're together because I live in Ontario. 
um, and they're just like, oh, isn't that cute? That's so pretty. And like no interest whatsoever. And that's okay. I don't expect them to be interested in what I do. Um, but if I ask them for a book for Christmas or my birthday, they are like, what is it? What can we get you? And like, just tell us, tell us, send us the link. <laughs> they're over the moon to give, to give me something that they know that I will love. So if you can't decide on one, pick one get started and then ask for the others for gifts and you will slowly amass your library. Honestly, your library will be huge in another 10 or 15 years. It, you don't have to just pick one. And the other thing is these books are available digitally. So if you don't want the physical footprint of a book, you can absolutely get them digitally and get, get your friends and family to send you the Kindle version. Um, so that's enough of me waxing poetic about that. So let's do the rest of community participation. All right. Yeah. Big chats today about big topics, you guys, big topics. <laughs> All right. This is our breeding color study. This is from, from our Shetland study. So this is going back to this time last year. And I thought these were so cute. Crystal, you did a great job. I think she already said goodbye, but it's so good. I couldn't decide how to use my Shetland breeding color study. Once it was spun up, I had spun each braid into a three ply using different techniques to see what would happen. When I saw the year of gnomes knit along, I had had it. I am going to knit a year of gnomes to see how they differ or are similar using the same three skeins. These are my January gnomes. I knit two since they were small. The beard, nose, and hands are leftover commercial sock yarn. Aren't they sweet? They're so cute. Well done, Crystal. And this one is from Debbie. This is incredible. Debbie, this sweater is amazing. Um, it's been a while, but have still been following you all silently in the background. Beautiful work to all of you. I have finished up my breeding color study from the first half of 2001 and I love it. I spun it up as a three ply fractal worsted DK weight long backwards from the fold. I also bought a natural gray and black rovings from a local seller um, and was spinning that up as well and ended up with a sweater quantity of yarn. Um, it's so squishy. I was very happy with the outcome. I had to do a sweater or a cardigan, which I could cozy in and I received yarn and texture as a Christmas present. See case in point and saw the Tetris sweater pattern and thought it was perfect. The pattern is written for a sport fingering weight, but after a bit of sweater math, I at knitted it up in my DK. I love how she did the um, sleeves. I thought that was brilliant with that blending. And I must admit, it is one of my best sweaters yet. It is so comfy, cozy, and colorful. And it looks amazing on you, um, Debbie. Just awesome, fantastic job. Amazing sweater. That sweater is a stunner, right? Yes. Um, oh, Suzanne, that's the good thing about the, uh, the lives is that you can go back and watch the replay. Her mom called. <laughs> my mom would do the same thing right in the middle of it all. All right, this one is from Dorothy. She says, happiness is absolutely how special is that photo thank you for sharing that and this is from diana here are 10 spindles that i've been playing with and learning from more from um, i'm getting closer to finding the spindle style that makes the yarn i like to use and that doesn't hurt my hands the photo on uh, the first photo is them naked and then so that you can see their shape aren't those fun spindles i just love them this one on the far side right here is a creative Jane. I just think it's fantastic. Love that. And the Russian doll just makes my heart sing. It's a couple of Carrie cherries in there and a Volchuk arts and a silly salmon. So if you have any questions about these and you are part of the Slack channel, don't hesitate to ask Diana. Um, I think on Slack she is, let me just double check. She is at Diana Twists, so you can just ask her if you have any questions about her spindles. And she is such a wealth of knowledge. Please utilize her. So this is a natural shades along that's been ongoing. There's a whole rundown of all of our alongs that we have going on in the community in this month's housekeeping post. It's called Ketchup and Pickles. So um, you guys can check that out. And it is linked in the show notes. Um, at the top of the post, it says there's a lot going on in our community. Ketchup and pickles for January is here. So you can definitely check that out. I'll throw it because I'm looking at it. I'll throw it in the live chat as well. This is from Allison. So I just finished a mystery breed spin along that my guild did. Here are my six samples. We had to spin them, then guess which breed they were. So from number one on the left, she thinks she's, she thinks this is the answer, but she's not totally sure. I hope she lets us know. Um, 
Cheviot Devon Close Wool, which is a long wool, Hill Radnor, Welsh Mountain, Herdwick, and Finn. The last three I mostly identified by color and in addition I was familiar with the Kemp and the Wild Hairs in the Herdwick. The Finn had a shorter staple, was fine and soft, and the two I got wrong in my guess was the Cheviot and the Radnor. They are both really close in color, staple length, and both come from dense fleeces with blocky staples. I really don't know how to tell them apart. It was a fun experience and I enjoyed the challenge of the long wool as well as taking on the herdwick that I've read so much about. <laughs> uh, Christine says I've just des described her husband. I send him links of things that I like um, plus a couple of other things because he likes to get me at least one thing that I wasn't expecting. Okay so Christine that's what I do with Mike with my husband. I send him links throughout the year and he collects them all and saves them all and then every so often I get a surprise. Um, this is from Elizabeth. This is just beautiful. This is Shropshire. Shropshire. Uh, my first long way homestead breed study is done. It's a three ply, about 335 yards. So let's do the grist. She didn't, she didn't include that. I know that these are 100 grams. So 335 divided by 100 times 454 for the pound. And this is incredible. It's 1,521 yards per pound. It's fantastic, Christine. So talking about grist, there's no way to say whether or not this would be, you know, in line with a commercial yarn or not. This is a beautiful, fine, fine yarn that she's done. It's a three ply. It's just absolutely beautiful. And she got over 1500 yards per pound, which is just awesome. It will be knit into a pair of socks. Confession, I sent it back through the wheel to take out some ply twist. I tend to put in too much twist into my sock yarn and the first time it came out ropey and rough and I like to I like it much better with less twist. It was worth taking the time to make it right. That's fantastic, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing that, that you've done that. This is from Josie. This is, I love this. This is for our zero to hero, taking advantage of daylight to snapshots of my progress of the shift cowl. Hand spun is mostly the Ingle Nook Fibers pie blend and she's loving this. Um, we shared this finished yarn either last show or the show before. It was just beautiful, but now seeing it in the shift cowl, you're doing it justice, Josie. You're doing it justice, just beautiful. This is a, from Elizabeth. Um, this is some Rambouillet that I finished a couple of weeks ago So that is so squishy. I just realized that I never posted my finished sock yarn. After a bath, a lot of the kinks relax, so I'm excited to knit with it. Now I just need to figure out how to calculate grist. <laughs> There's a theme here, you guys. So you take your yardage, divide it by your grams, times 454 for the pound, and that's your yards per pound. Um, yards divided by grams times 454 equals yards per pound. It's in the chat. All right, this is from Alicia. Uh, finished this last week. Um, I really enjoyed spinning and plying this. It's a blend of merino, silk, and bamboo two ply. Got about 480 yards. Now I've never used bamboo before, but should I use a hot bath like I usually would? Or would it be better to give it just a warm bath? And the other question, what should I make out of this yarn? Any ideas are welcome. It's beautiful. I would make socks. Um, uh, in terms of the hot bath for the bamboo, you're not going to felt the bamboo. Um, you could felt the merino. So I never wash my yarns in really, really super, super hot water. Um, I tend to go on the warm side of lukewarm and, um, yeah, just give it a soak, mild detergent, mild, mild washing so soap, and uh, you're good to go. You don't need like eucalyn or soak or anything. It doesn't, you don't need the lanolin if you don't want to, but you could, you've got the merino in there, so you could use either of those. Yeah, just treat it like you would your wool, your wool skeins. Um, yeah, that's what I would do. This is from Shauna, my sock spinning adventure with BFL silk. It's been through the wash, but is just drying, is still drying. The first photo shows the unwashed, and I managed about 300 yards in 87 grams of traditional three ply in the big skein, and 70 yards in 27 grams for the contrast. Isn't that pretty? The smaller two are 10 and three grams of chain plied leftovers, and I'm excited to start my socks. Everybody is knitting socks, and isn't that yarn incredible? Beautiful. 
Okay, we've got a couple more. I'm gonna have to cut this off because I gotta go get the kids. Um, this is from Megan. Um, what what's that they say about sampling? Let me tell you, it's a real thing. In this wool's defense, it had me as it had me as its owner, and I was new, like a week into owning a spinner, and I didn't know much. Now this braid is beautiful, and I, as its proud owner, thought to ply, as most new spinners do. However, I wasn't consistent. No, didn't know about rewinding to ply from the first ends, and I think I may have even got the ends swapped, as nearly the entire skein was barber pulled. Problem with that was that two of the colors together just didn't sing to me. So this story really is about the metamorphosis of an ugly, to me, duckling reinventing itself to become a swan. So this little barber pulled two ply, let's call her Barb, sat on a shelf for weeks. She'd come out to play every once in a while, perhaps get knit into a wee swatch to say, hey, what could I be one day? to only later that day be ripped back out, wrapped back around up the ball and put away in the shadows again. Until a week ago, that is, Barb finally spoke up and said, no more. So off she went to get unplied. She found herself in a bit of a tangle and was all worked up. So she went for a wee soak to relax. From there, she was overspun in a few spots. She went back through the spinner for a bit of an untwisting, then back into some hot and cold water for a bit of fulling as she decided she needed no other and was happy to be single. <laughs> Barb's been hanging out in the sun, enjoying her new life until she finds her forever home in whatever knitted form she becomes. <laughs> I love our community. I would just like to say, <laughs> When I was reading that earlier this week, I just, I was like crying. I was laughing so hard. I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to get through reading it, but I held it together. I held it together, you guys. Oh my goodness. Barb finally spoke up and said, no more. Hear the raven, no more. <laughs> oh, such a good story. Absolutely. This is from Philippe. I had promised to share this um, last week when I had forgotten to include them. Um, this was from his blending board exploration. So my swatches are now dry and I can draw some pre preliminary conclusions from them. The one figuring on the left was knit with a yarn plied from three separate bobbins, each of which containing one roll leg pulled from the same load on the blending board. The target here was to check how consistent my drafting was while spinning the singles. The length of each color should be ideally should have ideally been identical to create a smooth transition among the colors. Of course, having only one strand and even two of them in a certain color, either um, either shorter or longer than the others, wouldn't be a big problem as it was my intention to have uh, to also have a hazy color transition with bits of the previous or the next shade popping through, uh, poking through and popping up. My goal was achieved in this swatch up to the transition from the red to the orange where one ply in scarlet was long enough to turn the whole thing into just a marbled yarn. This happened because either I could not keep track of my consistency while spinning one of the roll eggs or because one of them ended up being having a consistently larger chunk of scarlet fiber when I pulled it off the board. That's probably what happened. Um, you probably just ended up with more color in that particular roll egg. The swatch on the right was knit in with a yarn chain plied from a roll egg in the same colors and as I already expected the color transitions emerged more evenly almost like horizontal stripes. The effect was softened at certain points where I was able to draft out two colors simultaneously as they shifted in the roll egg. Analyzing both swatches I do prefer the one on the right with the chain plied yarn and what is your favorite? So I have to admit I do like the chain plied myself. Yeah. That is my favorite. I think it's it's really neat to be able to create those slower transitions of color and to create that hazing so that they just kind of haze together. I think that's really fantastic. In this situation, I think this one works really well. I think I think the chain plied really you you kind of knocked this one out of the park. And last but not least, this is from Amanda. She's been playing with some beautiful weaving on the loom. I've been playing with a 12 over 1 flax warp for some linen towels. After four meters of 
same weft as warp I decided I wanted to actually be able to see the twill pattern for a while so I have been playing with some of the random yarns in my stash which is so much fun I can already tell that this navy blue 15 to 1 alpaca merino has changed the hand of the cloth by quite a bit isn't that incredible beautiful Amanda I look forward to seeing what it will do when it hits the wet finishing stage amazing beautiful so we have had a full show it has been so good to sit here with you guys and to talk um, we kind of went a little bit off off the beaten path by going into that big chat about the grist but I think it's important to sort of honor some of those conversations and to take the time to explain it so that people really understand and if you have any further questions or comments please don't hesitate to put them below in the comment section here on YouTube as always, I am happy to chat anytime. You can find me as well for pearls and woolen spinning. Um, well for pearls on Ravelry and woolen spinning on Instagram. If you send me a direct message on Instagram and I don't get back to you right away, it's just because I don't see them right away. I don't check Instagram every day, um, but I am around. And you can always message me on the Slack channel. So until next time, happy spinning, happy making all the things wish me luck on ripping out the uh, wool and honey and i hope you guys are are really good and, and making lots wherever you are and i will see you same time same place next weekend no not next weekend next tuesday <laughs> i'm even messing myself up so until then happy 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 spinning and have a really wonderful rest of your week bye everyone